Hi, everybody, and welcome to AQ's Blog and Grill. We're excited today to have the president and CEO of Exonify, which is an exciting new startup here in the Waterloo region that's going to go global, no doubt about it. And Carol Lehman is their president and CEO. Now, when people ask me who my entrepreneurial hero is in this area, I say Carol Lehman. And why is that? Because this woman has a batting average of 1,000. She has the batting record as for any entrepreneur that I know. So welcome, Carol. Thank you very much, Alan. You're welcome. So tell us a little bit about Exonify. I know you guys are kind of in the e-learning platform area, but what's up and what's new? Well, Exonify, we're excited as of tomorrow to be announcing that we're moving away from the e-learning category. Wow. And we're creating a new category called Knowledge. And so the evolution of Exonify over three years has really um, helped us define a broader category. Mm -hmm. And e-learning is what people consider to be the old way to deliver learning, knowledge, information through technology. E-learning is really just about the delivery mechanism. And over the last three years and working with our customers, we've come to realize that what's at the center of both company performance and individual performance is this idea of knowledge. So we have evolved the platform to go from not just delivery, but acquisition, sharing, collaboration, application of knowledge, measurement of knowledge, and then tying all of that to the business outcome for the employer. And so uh, we're now a knowledge platform, not an e-learning platform alone. So you're evolving up the, uh, up the ladder into, uh, into knowledge. Well, that's exciting because remember Peter Drucker um, once said, we are now becoming knowledge workers. And now you guys are offering a, a platform for that knowledge to be shared. And so who are some of the clients that you've been working with so far in Exonify and maybe in the future? Uh, we, we have about almost 100 now global brand name customers. So the likes of uh, Walmart, Toys R Us, Bloomingdale's in the retail space, mm -hmm. and also some very large grocery chains. To, um, and, and I characterize those customers as they've got high numbers of hourly paid, high turnover associates. Right whose levels of knowledge, because they turn over so frequently, tend to not reach peak very quickly. And then the other half of our customers are what we call knowledge workers. Those are individuals who are more highly compensated, don't turn over as frequently, and have very complex knowledge that they need to retain in order to be top performers in their roles. So those are the likes of GE, Johnson mm -hmm. Johnson, John Hancock, um, companies like that. Right, isn't that exciting? That is a field that's only gonna get more and more uh, intense and interesting, so absolutely wow. good move. And it's one of the reasons I call you the, the home run hitter, because y you grew up in the, the accounting field, we're going to come back to that in a minute. And then you started with your your first startup, which was Fake Space. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you moved uh, to another startup and you built that up and then you sold that. And then there was um, the post rank, mm -hmm. which was fairly recent. Yeah. And that was sold to Google. Mm -hmm. And then Google, in their wisdom, says, yeah, well, we got this post rank thing, but we also want Carol Lehman uh, and tried to tailor a job for you. And at the same time, you knew something was happening at this startup called Exonify. Mm -hmm. So you had to make a tough decision. Yes, I did. Um, and it was tough only from the point of view of who wouldn't want to go to work for Google. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, an amazing company. Um, I think that for me, it was a tough decision, yes, mm -hmm. but also not. And that's a function of you get to an age where you kind of know what you're good at and what you like to do and what's going to make you successful mm -hmm. and what you're going to be happy doing. Right. And the reality for me is that in helping lots of early stage tech companies around Waterloo Region, mm -hmm. I know a lot uh, of them, and I often have the opportunity to get involved in things that um, that come from helping those companies. So 
I had both opportunities at mm -hmm. the same time, the Google one and then also this little company I was helping. And, and I know what I'm good at. <laughs> so two or three people, some software, you'd been mentoring them, and you decided to go all in. So there was some rationality, there was some emotion, and there was money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I think separates an entrepreneur from just somebody who starts a business. So you put your own money in. Yep. And that was three years ago, five years ago? Yeah, uh, four years ago. Four years ago. Wow. And so what kind of growth have you seen in that four years? Huge growth. We, uh, so as you say, when I bought Exonify and actually had a business partner. Mm -hmm. She's still my business partner. Right. The two of the uh, two of us acquired Exonify from the original founders. We picked up one customer and a couple of employees. And in that first year, we essentially re-architected the platform from scratch, right. raised a little bit of seed capital. Uh, we put our own money in and and then worked for a year for free, yes. basically. Right while we kind of got our legs under us. And so we went from that um, relaunch of the platform in September of 2012, so just over three years ago, to what is today about 100 customers, 10 million in revenue, 70 people, um, and customers all over the globe. And huge potential. Huge potential. I sounded a little bit like Donald Trump there, didn't I? Huge potential. <laughs> <laughs> so the co-founder. There's lots of entrepreneurs, there's lots of people who are, are getting businesses together. How important is it for you to find a co-founder that works really well with you? Uh, it's absolutely essential. And I see in mentoring lots of early stage companies, people make poor choices. Um, for me, Christine Tutzel is my co-founder. Mm -hmm. And Christine and I have very distinct skill sets that complement each other very right. well. And we're both mature, we've been around the block, we've done the startup thing previously, and we both, we don't get in each other's way, and we just were uh, pulling on the rope in the same direction. Right. Confidence in each other, competence in what you're good at. Absolutely. Let the other person, uh, let the other person Absolutely. go for it. Absolutely. Now, she, as I recall, has a really strong background in sales. She is a senior sales executive like none I've ever met in my life and will never meet again. <laughs> Excellent. I find too, now you, you've worked as a mentor at Communitech as well as the Accelerator Center. I've been able to have the same experience, fabulous. It is difficult sometimes to help founders understand how important it is to actually sell something. Have you found that as well? Absolutely. So um, people don't anticipate how difficult it is when you're building a new market, for example, mm -hmm. to build the right product, find customers willing to pay money for that product in volume. Yeah. And it, it is always the case. It takes three times as long and three times as much money as you ever expect it will. Right. And you have to just constantly be doing what I call moving up and to the right, which is evolving your product, mm -hmm. evolving your market attack, mm -hmm. evolving everything so that you take on board the learning every single day so that you can move up and to the right. right. And it's just, it's never easy. It is never easy. Isn't that something? Now, you have said in, in, a, in a previous interview that one of the things you would like Carol Lehman to be known for is, is your mentoring. What is it about mentoring and helping that, that kind of gets your heart going? I find it entirely energizing, actually, to sit with new entrepreneurs, and of any age, actually, mm -hmm. and listen to what they're thinking about mm -hmm. and what they're doing. And um, I don't know, I think it's just in me to want to help. Mm -hmm. I enjoy being able to help accelerate somebody else's path to success mm -hmm. and overcome or avoid mistakes I've made, many right. yeah, mistakes sure. I've made over the years. There's just something about it I love to do. And I always get something out of it too. It teaches me mm -hmm. about what's going on out there, oh, yeah. keeps me informed. And 
also gives me ideas that I can then take back to right. work and employ myself. Yeah. So it's always a two-way thing. Sure. And and I just love meeting new people. Yeah. And a great reciprocity, as you say. You, the, the old Chinese proverb, I guess, is you know he who teaches learns twice. Mm -hmm. She yes. who mentors learns. Absolutely the yeah. same thing. Good. Now we've had a lot of uh, founders on uh, the show here at AQs, um, women entrepreneurs. And I, don't, I never liked that term. I just refer to them as entrepreneurs. They just happen to be women. Now, there is a challenge though, and let's, let's be, be straight up on this, in terms of funding. We're finding, at least I see it, and I know you've commented on it before, is there seems to be a different um, scale in terms of women founders and funding. What have, what have you found? What's your opinion on that? Is it? Um, I think it's very different today. Than, and in fact, I would say today, there is virtually no difference. Ah. The, I wouldn't have said that two years ago. Just two years ago. Just two years ago. There was a slight difference. Mm -hmm. um, certainly five years ago. Well, women entrepreneurs in technology mm -hmm. were few and far between. So um, it has definitely come light years right. over the last five years. And I really don't think there's a difference anymore. If you have a great idea, if you have a lot of energy, mm -hmm. if you demonstrate, it's almost a personality thing. Mm -hmm. If sure. you demonstrate the right kind of mojo you, and you've got the right thing going on, you can find an investor, yeah. a gender agnostic. Great, That's, that is great news to hear. Is it any different uh, raising capital here in Canada or even in the Waterloo region than it may be in California or New York? Absolutely it is. Yeah. Um, in fact, I just did an interview with the Globe and Mail that was about what Canadian funders can do to help be right. the landscape here. And the simple reality is there is so much more money in the U.S. Mm -hmm. than there is in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I expect that will always be true. But it could be better in Canada. And I think there are two opportunities that we have that I really hope over the next five to ten years take root. And that is entrepreneurs like me who have had exits take some portion of that capital and reinvest in mm. the new entrepreneurs in the the local region. Right. So I've done that. A handful of others have done that locally, but not enough in my opinion. Now we haven't had a tremendous number of exits either. So as that evolves, mm -hmm. I hope to see more of right. that reinvesting in others right. and kind of seeding um, the bigger picture. Yeah, leaving a legacy that Exactly. That built. Yeah. Exactly. The second piece of it is there are, I spoke to the top 100 Canadian CEOs a couple of years ago, most of whom run very traditional, long standing corporations. Mm -hmm. They have a massive amount of locked up capital in those companies mm -hmm. that if each one of them took $5 million or $10 million and created a little investment fund mm -hmm. that um, did seed investments in innovation and maybe it's within their sector. Mm -hmm. That would go a huge way right. to fostering innovation in the country with capital that's in the country and, and doesn't involve traditional venture capital. Right. So I think both of those opportunities are yet untapped in Canada. Well, you know, I read that interview. <clears throat> I think it was Friday, last yeah. Friday in the Globe. And I thought, wow, that is such a great idea because as you say, I've seen the balance sheets. The money is there and it's it just is. sitting there. It is. And it could be actually leveraged to finance, capitalize the next wave of economic prosperity that this country is going to need. Completely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we talk a good game, I think, sometimes about innovation. It's really time to really get the rubber on the road and put some money behind it and see where we go. That's right. Now, you graduated from the University of Waterloo with a degree in accounting. Mm -hmm. Why accounting? What was the thing that drove Carol to um, the, the accounting stream? Uh, well, the truth is... I hope so. <laughs> the truth is that I was dating a guy in accounting at Waterloo. <laughs> of course. And it's always about a boy or a girl. That's right. Yes, right. And I... I was living in Ottawa, 
and trying to choose between business programs mm -hmm. and ultimately chose Waterloo to come here to be close to him. Sure. And mm -hmm. so that's how I chose accounting. Waterloo didn't have a Bachelor of Commerce right, program, right. but it had a Master of Accounting program. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's how I chose my education, believe it or not. Now, in hindsight, mm -hmm. it was ideal. Great ideal asset for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then then you went from the U of W into KPMG. Yes, and you were there for a while. Yeah. So what was it about uh, you know working with a large chartered accountancy firm that prepared you then for your entrepreneurial success? I would say I first of all I always knew somehow uh, that I would be an entrepreneur. I told people that when I was mm -hmm. a teenager. In fact. Okay. Um, why, I don't know. My parents were lifelong government workers, so I didn't have that in the family yeah, DNA, right. certainly. Yeah. The KPMG, I did all my you know work terms, went to work after I graduated, and it was a really good foundation for just solid business learning. Mm -hmm. And it was a client of mine, Electra Home, that uh, offered me a job in their corporate finance team. Right. And I ended up taking the job and then spent the next number of years doing mostly capital raising, merger acquisition work. Mm. And that was a great foundation, sure. ultimately, for running early stage technology companies, most mm -hmm. of which need capital. Right. So we bought a company in California that was early stage, very, uh, high-end technology, mm -hmm. yeah. and that was fake space. I remember. And that's what got me on the trail to running companies. Um, I became the CEO of fake space. And the company after fake space was? RSS Solutions. RSS Solutions, yeah. So this is where you've put this string of, of home mm -hmm. runs together, which is which is just so inspiring. Um, that, that you, can, you can do these things, and as you like to say, or at least I've heard you say, I just do my job. Yep. I just do my job. I have a job just like everybody else in the company mm -hmm. has a job. And I think my best skill is allowing other people to do their jobs. Mm -hmm. Hiring the best people I can find. And and I, I live that. Right. Hire the best people you can find and then allow them to do their jobs mm -hmm. by letting them understand and participate in what the framework needs to be. Right. And it has worked out very well so far. Uh, so so it's kind of a formula in my view. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you've got puzzle pieces to put in place mm -hmm. and then you build the puzzle. Yeah. A fellow that, that I've spent a lot of time reading is Stephen Covey. And one of the things that I find really interesting about Covey is this, this expression, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Mm -hmm. And it sounds really funny, but boy, when you're starting a business and when you're growing a business and when you're seeing that business emerge into its next stage, you look back and you go, oh yeah, I had to do that. Or I would have been distracted. Yeah. I, I might have been off on a pivot, which sounded really exciting at that time, but wasn't really the, the right way to go. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not to say you always stay the course, but if the main thing is always up here, mm -hmm. then, it, then it does help you make decisions. So what is going to be next for Exonify? And thank you very much for sharing your knowledge uh, development that's going to be that's going to be great what do you see um, next for exonify is it going to be more of a global thing or lots of things so we have many prongs that we're going to be pursuing in 2016 one of which is um, a deeper penetration into the international business mm -hmm. we tested those waters this last year uh, in a bigger way and Christine, my business partner, in fact, took on the mission of going outside of North America and seeing mm -hmm. what appetite there was for Exonify. Right. Uh, she is actually about, she's in Australia today, um, hopefully signing the biggest deal we'll have as a company yet. So yeah, we're excited about that. That's great. Uh, we have a very big deal in South Africa coming up, mm -hmm. uh, expected to be signed in January. And so international, penetration is a huge objective of ours sure. next year. The The other big thing from a um, product point of view is that we are moving into uh, real measurement of behavior ah. and, 
and predicting how behavior change mm -hmm. ties to a financial statement Bigger. line item. Yeah. And so we ha are working with a couple of customers, Walmart being the mm -hmm. biggest, to measure on the platform actual activity on the job mm -hmm. that ties to what the individual has demonstrated they know or don't know. And then being able to predict either growth in sales mm -hmm. or reduction of expenses, depending on what the, the knowledge is you need them to act right. on. And we've got some super exciting um, predictive analytics that are coming up in this next year. Wow, that's exciting stuff. And we know that behavior is becoming the key element to a successful business. It's, yes. I mean, even from the marketing field, the, the people who are at the CEO position who have likely come up through the finance trail look back at you and say, what can I measure? Yes. What will it do? Yes. And it's not about attitude. It is about behavior. So you're, a little bit of brain science must be involved mm -hmm. in that, which is another exciting new area. So who are you working with in terms of that? We have had a partnership for the last three years with the Rotman Institute at Baycrest in Toronto and Perfect. one of their researchers there. And we do employ three core brain science concepts mm -hmm. in how the brain works to actually remember, take on board, and mm -hmm. then remember and pull out key pieces of information wow. at the point of need. And it's super cool how yeah. it works. It's oblivious to the employee using the platform right. every day, but it works very effectively to create memory and retention in the brain. And uh, I give talks actually frequently on brain science. Mm -hmm. People love to understand how your mind works yeah. to remember. Oh yeah. Um, so it's it's something that's core to the platform, mm -hmm. core to the value we deliver, core to what makes it work, and uh, will always be sort of that central, um, the secret sauce in a way, oh, sure. in yeah. the middle of what we do. The main thing uh, could be brain science. Yes. Who knows? Yeah. Yes. So well, I want to wrap up just on on one last question, Carol, and it, you you also work as a angel investor. You've, you've invested in, in other firms. What is it? What are the three things that, that you look for when people are presenting themselves and you're sitting there and the PowerPointless, the PowerPoint is up there, but you're thinking and feeling. What are the three things that you are really looking for in, an, in your next investment? Two of them have to do with the entrepreneur, mm -hmm. um, himself or herself. One is just sheer smarts. Mm -hmm. There are an awful lot of smart young entrepreneurs out there and so that's a that's table stakes gotcha you need to have somebody who's super smart the second thing is um there's a certain energy mm -hmm. that is hard to put a description to right. in an accurate way it's an intangible mm -hmm. feeling you get from the entrepreneur that they are going you know they are going to give it their all mm -hmm and figure it out. And then the third thing's the idea. And because I speak to so many young entrepreneurs and keep my finger on the pulse of what's really going on in the world, right. I can always have a general sense of whether it's a unique idea, something that I think a market would exist mm -hmm. for or does exist for. So it's marrying all of those things. And I always come down on the side of, I'd rather have a superlative entrepreneur with a mediocre idea because that entrepreneur will figure it, figure out, it out and turn the mediocre idea into a great idea yeah. versus a mediocre entrepreneur with a fantastic idea. Those entrepreneurs tend to struggle executing on their fantastic idea. Right. And more often than not, in my experience, they have a hard time getting anywhere. So it comes down to the person. It really does, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, I, a mark of a true entrepreneur is if they're pitching and the PowerPoint goes down, can they still tell you all about their company yeah. with passion? And inspire. And inspire. And, and sometimes they can and sometimes they can't. Yeah. Well, there you go. Carol, it's been uh, terrific having you here today. One of my entrepreneurial heroes. I don't get to do this very often, so thank, thank you for coming. You. And thanks for joining us here on AQ's Blog and Grill. Um, stay tuned, and we'll tell you more about upcoming episodes. Thank you.
KQ's Blog and Grill.